thing was Paul said that I'll glory in a cross, but when, the, when you were singing those songs, and you know, when we went through the book of Galatians, I quoted that verse many, many, many times. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I tell you what, if it wasn't for the cross, we'd all be doomed. And, uh, yes, and when God sees me, he sees all the ordinances of the law that were against me, nailed to his tree, and he sees that when Jesus said, it is finished, it's paid in full for me. Yes. And you know, it's great that I can even think of that while you're singing, because it goes along with First John. Uh, and we're gonna talk about, uh, if, as time permits, uh, um, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I want to drive home a point is that most of us, God will forgive us, but we won't forgive ourselves. And if that's true, then we call God a liar. Let me read these verses and we'll go into our study. Uh, starting at verse uh, uh, 5, 1 John chapter 1. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, help us to realize that this book that you've given us, your word, is not for theologians. You said all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Father, it's just simple understanding since Jesus went to the cross. You didn't make this book hard for us to understand, but it is spiritually discerned. So we rely on the Holy Spirit to apply these truths to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sorry about my voice, but it's just the way it is. So it's life. All right, uh, we, looked at, we looked at verse 6 uh, last week, and we looked in 1 John um, in verse 6 here, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And we looked at uh, um, uh, John, um, I mean, uh, uh, John chapter 12 last week where Jesus said, I am the light. And it was an example there that many of them believed on him, but because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God, they wouldn't confess him. Uh, and uh, now we want to look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 6. And we want to keep in mind that uh, what he's saying here in verse uh, uh, 6 is that if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In Matthew chapter 6, I want to read verse 22 first and then we'll read, uh, read it in context. The light of the body is the eye. This is in Matthew 6, 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the, thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled full of light. Now, what does that mean? Oh, I can tell you what it means. I can tell you what I think it means. But if we look at it in context, we'll understand very simply what it means. And we'll start in verse um, uh, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. Now we will see this in 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it is of the world, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So here you have, you have, the, you have a situation that every one of us experience in our life. We have the allurement of the world that wants to attract our attention, but we cannot have a divided attention. Either we're going to focus on God or we're going to focus on the world, but you cannot focus on both of them. 
and we'll see that also in another place when we get to it. Uh, no man can serve two masters. So he said, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. But if thine eye be double, no, if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be filled with darkness. Let's go on and finish reading this here. Let me start in verse uh, uh, 19 again, so we can get this in context. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. I think it was uh, not Nate Saint, it was... Um, Keep forgetting his name, but he was one of the martyrs from the Alka Indians, um, and uh, he said he is no fool that will uh, 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 keep what he cannot lose and give up what he can't keep. You know, in other words, it, it was just a variation of this. You're not going to hold on to this world. When we have possessions, you wonder what possesses who or who possesses what. You see. Uh, and so we can lay up for ourselves. I mean, it's in us to want to have pleasure. We want to satisfy the flesh, even in moral things. It doesn't have to be immoral, but it can draw us away from God. And so we have to have our, uh, and the Bible says that, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We have not been called here as born again children of God to live the life of luxury. We have been called to Right. Suffer for his sake. We have not been here called to, and, and, and this is the illusion, the false illusion that Christianity has given to the world. You accept Christ and everything will just be smooth. It, no, that's when the war is on. That's when I talked to a fellow yesterday, and he says, you know, something about other churches. Do you, you know, we were talking about problems that uh, Baptist church have, you know, in the in, internal part of it. And he said, do you think Catholics have those problems? Well, I used to be Catholic, and I said, no, I don't think they have those problems. There's petty differences between pe people, but there's not instigators who are always going against the priest or anything. Do you know why? Satan's not going to cause agitation where they're being blinded by a false religion. Mm -hmm. And if that light that be in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? People are going to hell with artificial light. Artificial light is just another word for religion. And the world is incurably religious. I don't care if you go to the bush in New Guinea, you will find people over there worshiping something. They worship the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Now, why do they do that? Because they're ignorant of God. Now, is, is God unbalanced or did he not offer salvation? Every The Bible said their sound went out through all the world. It is our responsibility. Now, there's generations probably over New Guinea where they heard the word of God and in different places, but they went back into their superstition and another generation, another, and they're ignorant of the word of God. But it is the generation that had the truth that has the responsibility of propagating the truth. God said to Ezekiel, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Hear the word of my mouth and give them warning for me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest them not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So we have the responsibility. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, you have a responsibility to people that you like and that you don't like to at least offer them the gospel. They might reject you, but Jesus said, if they reject you, remember, they rejected me first. If the world would love you, the world will love his own. You ain't doing anything as a Christian. If the world loves you, this lifestyle evangelism, I'm just going to win people by being a nice guy. You're crazy in a bed bug. I'm telling you, because it is the faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God, and I say this again, and I've said it again and again, the biggest turning to God in the Bible was in Nineveh from a prophet who didn't like Ninevites, and 120,000 of them got saved. Uh, better, bigger than Pentecost, and a week later there was a 1,000 more than Pentecost that got saved there. But the biggest turning was in Nineveh, and you know why? It wasn't the personality of, of uh, thank you, it wasn't the personality of Jonah it was the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
in this book, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Then he said, there is one that judges you. And we looked at that last week. The words that I speak, the same will judge you on the last day. If you want to live without God and you want to find out where you're going to spend eternity and what it's going to be like, read the Bible just out of curiosity. And it won't be a pleasure. And the Bible says, I mean, because it speaks judgment to the lost and blessing and hope and encouragement to the saved. Because we, 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 in fact, I was talking to a fellow last Saturday, uh, he goes to an, another Baptist church, and we were talking about revisions. I do not agree with the revisions, I agree with the authorized version. But we use this as an example, it says, run the race with, in Hebrews, run the race with, it's not that I forgot, <laughs> run the race with patience. And I said to him, I said, do you ever see somebody running down the road and they look like they're patient? <laughs> you just don't attach that adjective to somebody who's running. But the Bible says run the race with patience. In the revisions, it says run the race with endurance or run the race with perseverance. Well, if you're running the race with endurance and you don't endure, what does that mean? Well, you've lost the race. Well, when it says run the race with patience, it's because it's already been won in Jesus Christ. And if you have to persevere, then you could lose your salvation. Huh? You know, it, it, they, the things that are in the Bible, the Bible says all things are simple to him that hath understanding. Well, were you born with understanding? I certainly wasn't. God gives you that through the word of God. He gave these, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and David, uh, Daniel, he gave them wisdom. They weren't born with it. You know why? Because they set themselves apart for God. Daniel purposed in his heart. He didn't get together with Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah and said, boy, we need to stick together. All these other people are going to eat all this meat that's offered to these strange gods, and you know that we're not supposed to do that as Jews. So why don't we get, no, Daniel purposed in his heart and encouraged Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah to do the same thing. You can live for God, and you can encourage somebody else to live for God without ever saying anything. Just your you're, you're running the race with patience. Um, so let's go on here. But lay up for yourself, verse uh, 20, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. You know why? Because our, our uh, salvation is secure, not because of your faithfulness, but because of Jesus' faithfulness. Now, let's go on here. So we're looking at this in context. For where your treasure is there, will your heart be also? And by the way, it's with the heart man believes unto righteousness. The heart is more powerful than the mind. The mind can think things through, but the heart can entertain things that are just inexplicable with words. When you say to somebody, I love you, and you really love them, and they say how much, you cannot articulate how much you love somebody. All the poems and songs down through the ages that, are, that have been sung, that have been written, they start out like, love is like, love is like, love is like. You know why they can't tell you what it is? Because they do not know, but the Bible says, God is love. But they want to avoid God. They want to avoid God. Uh, but, uh, 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 you know, when I, I tell my uh, granddaughter and my grandson, I said, Poppy loves you so much. It's because we can't do that. Do you know who I'm quoting? I'm quoting God. For God, that's right, he doesn't even measure it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's with the heart, and it, it, it just depends on what you love. What you love is what you'll gravitate to. Not what you think about, but what you really love, that's what you'll gravitate to. Now, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that be in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 Jesus said, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then Jesus said, Well, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I'm not going to go into it. I've done it before, but you study the word iniquity. And the word iniquity means that you are, are trusting in your religion. That's what iniquity is. It equates itself with religion, and it's based on the motivation that motivates people into religion without accepting Christ is guilt. Um, the wise woman of Tekoa, I think it's in Second uh, Samuel 14, the wise woman of Tekoa went up to David with a pretended story about how, how she was a widow. She had two sons. The one son rose up and killed the other son, and now everybody in the town said he should die because he's a murderer. Now, she went to David with this story. Joab put these words in her mouth. She went to David with that story, and she says, but if they kill him, then it'll quench my coal. Now, it might not mean anything to you and me as a Gentile that we have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but it means everything to a Jew, a Jew that is alive any time in history. He can shake that chain all the way back to Abraham, but he needs it to shake it all the way to the second coming, which they nationally haven't believed has happened yet when Christ came. And he is coming again. But they need that. And so it's a very important thing for, for her to keep that family line going. And David says, uh, go your way and I'll give counsel concerning this. Now, uh, she said, let the iniquity be on me, but thou on thy throne be guiltless. The word iniquity, when people gravitate to religion, without having Jesus Christ uppermost and fully in their heart, it is because they have guilt and they're buying off a guilty conscience with religion. You can generally tell somebody it's religious as opposed to a Christian. You know why? You just talk to them. Well, I got to go to church. I got to read my Bible. I got to do this instead of it's a pleasure to do it. And I'm telling you, it's not... It's not easy to do those things. You have to fight to do those things because Satan will fight against you. Like I told that fellow yesterday, I said, well, why would Satan want to upset the Catholic Church or Mormons or any dead church? Why would he want to do that? But if, there, if the word of God is being taught, you're always going to find somebody that despises you for it. You're always going to. Uh, you say, oh, they wouldn't do that if you're really telling the truth. Jesus is truth incarnate, and they hated him. Many said in John chapter 6, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And many walked no more with them. Why? Because he gave them doctrine that he knew that they were just following him because they ate food and they got to see a miracle. They did not love him. They just followed him for the show. So if your eye be single, the whole body shall be filled with life. But if the eye be evil, the whole body shall be filled with darkness. And if that darkness be in you, um, uh, then how great is that darkness? You know why? You know why it's a great darkness? Because you're stuck with yourself. For better, for worse, forever. Not for a long time, forever. And God says, choose you this day who you'll serve. God will make you make that choice. You say, I won't make that choice. That's a choice. God says, choose you this day who you'll serve. Now, speaking in regards to the uh, the aborigine living in New Guinea. You, you, in the United States, we are so gospel hard here that you really have to give a discourse on John 3.16 for 16 months, you know, just to get the point across to people. But you can say it once over there, and the people will say, wow. Why? Because we are gospel hard. They haven't, they're, 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 that would break up that fallow ground over there in a skinny minute. We're over here. We just shrug it off. God's an equal opportunity. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and, and worldly lust, we should live soberly and godly and righteously in this present world. All right, so we got that. Now verse 7. <clears throat> but, I, uh, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know what the problem of professing Christians and real Christians, you know what the problem is? They just do not believe God's word. They, I believe God will forgive me for lying, but he won't forgive me for murder. Not that I want to murder anybody, but he won't forgive me for that. Yes, he will. Do you know that the sin, the sin that, 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 that spiraled the human race into what it is right now was not holding up liquor stores. It wasn't uh, selling dope. It was mere disobedience, and that's what we do every day. Adam and Eve, uh, Eve uh, didn't actually disobey God. Adam did. Eve was not created when God gave the command, but Adam was, and Adam disobeyed God, and it threw the human race into what it is today so that nothing shocks us. A week ago today, uh, 26 people were killed in a Baptist church in, in uh, Texas, and a few more, several more injured or something like that. doesn't even shock us anymore. I mean, really, does it? Did you dwell on that this week? I mean, I really didn't. It's a shocking thing, but we don't, we're, we're, we're really getting desensitized to the value of human life. Now, um, now, actually, I don't put that much premium on my own life, really. You know what scares me? Not death. I'm not a hero. I'm not a tough guy, but death doesn't scare me. You know what scares me? Life. But I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And Paul said to be depart and to be with God is far better. But to be here, it's more necessary. And I, and I, God knows my heart, and I pray just like Paul did, that I want to finish my course. Whatever it is, I want to finish it. Uh, now, we're going to turn over to Psalm. Okay, let me read uh, verse 7 again. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. I want to turn over to uh, Psalms 119. If we walk in a light as he is in a light. Well, what is that light? Well, if we think it's physical light, which I already know we don't believe that, but if we thought it was physically light, we wouldn't have much fellowship today because it's overcast. Do you know that actually physically it affects people the same way that walking in spiritual light affects us? On a sunny day, on a sunny day, you'll find that people are more chipper, they're more happy, they're more, they're, they'll make more contact with you, even strangers. But on a gloomy day, we're just not there. I don't feel it there. I would rather, I hate the cold, I really do, but I would rather live in 15 degree colder temperature on a bright sunny day than I would 15 degrees warmer and it'd be overcast and cloudy. It just makes you feel different. But if we walk in the light, well, what is that light? Well, here it is right in here, in, in uh, uh, Psalms 119, verse uh, 130. The entrance of thy word, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Keep that in mind, it giveth understanding. We'll find out where understanding comes from uh, or how we get that in a minute or a few minutes. But the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. While I'm here, I want to look at, uh, uh, because this Psalms 119 is the heart of the word of God. Psalms 119 is all about the word of God. Psalms 119 is the longest chapter in the word of God. It is not by mistake either. It is the longest chapter because it's all about the word of God. It has words like precepts, commandments, statutes, judgments, way, which is a noun, way. How do I know that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. When they, before they were called Christians, they were called that way. You see, that's what they were called. So the, all those are aspects and facets of the word of God. Now, that's Psalms 119. Psalms 119, I believe, is the key to the Bible. The key to Psalms 119 is Psalms 19 because you have the law of the Lord is perfect in Psalms 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. It doesn't give you the definition of the word law. It gives you the application of the word law. The, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. It doesn't define testimony. It tells you what testimonies do. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing your heart. It tells you what the statutes do. So when you read Psalms 119, it gives you an 
outlay of the word of God. When you read Psalms, when you read Psalms 19, it gives you the applications of these words that are used over and over and over again in Psalms 119. Do you know what an interesting fact is? And it's just, uh, just, just amazes me. Psalms 119, the heart of the word of God. Psalms 19, the heart of the, uh, uh, the key to Psalms 119. Do you know what the 19th book in the Bible is? Romans. No, I'm only kidding. It's Psalms. <laughs> the 19th book. So, it's a, But here's, here's something I want you to look at here. Because, because we have an idea. And the pulpit historically, has done a good job on disarming the pew by touting their degrees and um, talking about their uh, seminary and their uh, Bible college experience and all that. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that. What I am saying is they've disarmed the, the a church attender by touting their degrees. Listen to this here. This is great. You know what the only limitations for you understanding this Bible here, you know what the only limitation is? It's you. The Bible says they limited the Holy One of Israel. Do you know how they limited them? By their unbelief. Jesus in his own hometown couldn't do many mighty miracles there. You know why? Because of their unbelief. Look at this. I love this. It's Psalms uh, 119, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Oh, how love I thy law. Isn't that an amazing thing? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Does that mean that if you keep the law, you get saved? Well, you can't keep it because you were born in sin. And I don't care if you lived in an incubator all the rest of your life. You were born in sin. You cannot keep the law. And if you offend the law at one point, you broke the whole law. So what does that mean? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect. You are not, I'm not. And that brings us to repentance. If we really look at that, the law of the Lord is perfect. I'm not. But it says, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that the law is called, he called the law, the ministration of death. And it gives a contrast when he's writing to the Corinthians, that if the, that if the ministration of the law was glorious, how much more glorious is the gospel? And here the psalmist writes, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all, uh, uh, all the day. Psalms 1, uh, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. If thine eye be single, the whole body shall be filled with light. Within that law, thy meditate day and night. If the law is glorious, how much more is the gospel of grace? It costs God everything to save me who am nothing. And you are too. God bankrupt heaven to save you and to save me. We have no right to just think that this is something that the ultra-Christian reads once in a while. It is a daily consumption because Jesus, who is called the Word of God, and when he comes back in judgment in Revelation 19, his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God said, without me, you can do nothing. He didn't say you can't do anything. He said you can do nothing. You can't do anything apart from his Word. You cannot live the Christian life from memory any more than you can satisfy hunger from memory. Long about 12, 15, uh, Satan certainly interrupts the congregation when the pastor's right at the point of his message where he wants to drive home the point because we're all thinking about dinner, right? Not me, but, but we're all thinking about dinner. And then, well, when you're sitting there in a the pew and you get real hungry, you said, you know, I had a real great meal yesterday. I'm just going to remember that. Oh, man, do I feel full. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If it was a good meal, it makes you hungrier for today. If it was a lousy meal, then maybe you can say, well, I don't want to do that again. 
but if it was a good meal, it'll make you hungry. And this is, the word of God is spoken of as water, which is essential for life. It is spoken of as milk, which is essential for life. It is spoken of as bread, which is essential for life. It is spoken of as strong meat, which is essential for growth and strength. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot live the Christian life apart from this. You can't do it. And it is the living word of God. It's the only book in all of our, all the expanded, expanding universe that we live in today. It's not just the Library of Congress or this little planet that we happen to live on. In all of the universe that God has created, this is the only book that is the living word of God. And that's why Satan fights it. He, if you're saved, if you're saved, he cannot take away your salvation. He can get you to doubt it, but he cannot, he knows he cannot because you've been born again. I am always related to my father. He's passed now, but I'm related to him because I was born into that family. But if Satan can't separate you from God, and the Bible says that in Romans chapter 8, what he will do, and he'll fight you tooth and nail on it, don't ever think that you've got the victory. Because it's, it's a daily fight. He will separate you from the Bible. And he'll do it. You know, and you already know this by experience. I know it by experience. It's just not convenient to read the word of God. It has to be a determination. It has to be a self-discipline to read the word of God. And you put that primary in your life. I thank God for this. And I do not brag about it. I thank God for it. Brother Clark, uh, pastor of this church, when I came here on September 5th, 1971, I went to St. Rock's that morning at a 9 o'clock mass. I came here for an 11 o'clock service. Brother Clark gave me a Bible. I knew how inconsistent I was with everything in life. I knew it. I mean, I just, anything that required discipline or, or work or determination, I just sidestepped it. But I knew after the Lord saved me, I, I, I thought I had a hold on to him. I didn't know that he held on to me because all I had was religion in my background. But I knew and I experienced 2 Corinthians 5, 17 before I ever read it in the Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I know specifically two of the things. He said all things, but two of the things that become, and we'll see this in 1 John, we know that we have passed from death unto life because blank, blank, blank. It is a tremendous thing as we're living here, as we're breathing, as we're prone to sin, and we've seen this in 1 John, if we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is written to a Christian. And, and, and we see that, and uh, we know that we've, um, that, that um, I lost my train of thought there, but we know that we're saved. And I knew, like I said, I knew how inconsistent I was uh, with everything else. But when Brother Clark gave me that Bible, I, deter I read somewhere that if you'll do something for 30 days, you'll make it a habit. And so I determined on that day, September 5th, 1971, to read the Bible every day for 30 days. God is my witness. I listen to the Bible too, but I never let that take the place of reading it. And since September 5th, 1971, till this morning, I've read my Bible every day. Do you know why? Because without him, I can do nothing. And you know why? I know that because God uses the weak things and the foolish things and the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are so that no flesh will glory in his presence. I have power because of the word of God, not because of me. I cannot live the Christian life from memory, and you can't either. But look, look at these verses in here, and you want to see your own limitations? You're limitless, and that depends on what your what your view of God is. I remind God every day, and especially when I come to teach Sunday school, that God is an infinite God. In other words, he's not limited. I, God has used me to preach messages before. I've not been called to preach, but God has used me to preach messages before, and I go back, and in pride, I think about it. I don't I don't really relish in that, but I know it's part of my nature. It's part of your nature, too. And I'm thinking, man, I could never top that one. And then I realize that God is infinite. I'm not. God is infinite. 
And so here we want to see this right in here. If there's a limitation on you, it's because you put it on yourself, not God didn't put it on you. Look at this right in here, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies. It is an amazing thing. We will go out out there and preach on the street and people will come up with a question. Now you have to, you have to, you know, keep the word of God in you, but, but somebody will say something and they think there's no way out for this answer and God will recall a, a verse of scripture that you have already read and he will apply it to that and he'll make you wiser than your enemies. Jesus ex exemplified that. They came to Jesus and these were very brilliant people. I mean, they were smart. They were not stupid. I already said that in different ways, but uh, uh, they came to Jesus and they said, uh, tell us, and they flattered him, and they said, should we pay tribute to Caesar? Now, if I say, and I have an audience of one person, and I say, you know, I don't agree with paying, paying taxes, and the government hears me, they just blow me off because I'm not worth the money it would cost, you know, and they say he'll trip over himself sooner or later. If I have a audience of 20, 30, 50,000, and Jesus had 20,000 just men besides the women and children. And if he says, no, we shouldn't pay tribute to Caesar, well, they're going to come after him like a bloodhound, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's influencing all these people. But if he says you've got to pay tribute to Caesar, and Caesar acknowledged himself that he was a god, forget that, <laughs> we got a few more minutes. Uh, uh, and now, if, uh, now, Caesar presented himself as if he was god, then that disqualifies Jesus from his whole ministry, if he says pay. So they got him in a, between a rock and a hard place. He can't get out of it. He said, show me a penny. Very simple. Whose superscription is this? And they said, well, Caesar's. And he said, then you render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and you render to God the things that are God. What he didn't say, but it's a given, is that everything Caesar had was God's anyway. He's given us life and breath. They take a woman taken in a very act of adultery, and this is how they thought that they were much smarter than Jesus because they knew he didn't go to the rabbinical schools there, and they take him and they throw him at the feet of Jesus, and they say, now this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. This is in the Gospel of John. You can let your imagination run with that if you want, but they, t but they only brought her, and, and uh, in the Levitical laws it said they should be stoned, but they just brought her. And they said... Uh, Moses said in the law that she should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Now I'm going to tell you something. If these people had enough brass on her, by brass on them, to bring this woman taken into very act of adultery, and I don't even believe that they said, little lady, get your clothes on. I think they took her just as the way she was and threw her at the feet of Jesus. Jesus didn't even look at her until everybody was gone, and he looked at that woman and he said, woman, where are those thine accusers? You know, that's what he did for you and me. The world accuses us. Satan accuses us. He's the accuser of the brethren. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. We don't forgive ourselves. Why? Because Satan will keep throwing up your sin in your face. But you just have to rely on the word of God. Satan's words aren't uh, uh, the living word. God's word is the living word. And they take this woman and they said, now, uh, 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 the law said she should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And then he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now, do you think, do you think, being as they had that much brass on them, that they all just threw up his hand, their hands and they said, well, he's got us there, boys, and just walked away? No, the Bible says they being convicted from the eldest to the youngest. And you know that the older salts there were going to impress these young protégés by going over to pick up a stone. Whatever Jesus wrote in the ground, it convicted them, and they dropped the stone and left. And when they all left, then he said, woman, where are those son accusers? You know, even your best friend will accuse you of something because it is in our nature to make ourselves look better at somebody else's expense. I wouldn't do that. You know, we can see things in other people that we don't see in ourselves. 
Let me finish this because I won't get to the other book. This is, uh, this is great, Psalms 119, 97. Oh, how love I lo the Lord is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies, for they are with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. You're limited only by your unbelief. Uh, verse uh, 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. It says in uh, Job, uh, 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 the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. To depart from evil is understanding. So you not only have to fear the Lord, but you should depart from those things. When, when nobody else is looking, you know God is. Uh, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I, I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me how sweet are thy words to my taste. I'm telling you something. The word of God is sweet. But when you entertain sin, it's bitter. The word of God is bitter to you. You do not want to fellowship with people because you, you think it's written all over your face, your guilt for your sin that you entertain. And you don't just fall into sin. You entertain it in your heart first. You might nurture it for a long time. You hear of a preacher go, having an affair or something. You say, wow, man, he just fell and he was that old. No, he entertained that for a long time. That's human nature. How sweet are thy words unto uh, my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You know, I'm going to end with this, but hate is a characteristic of Christianity. If you love something, you will hate something that offends it to the same degree. You say, I don't hate anybody. I'll tell you what, you have a little child. And you see somebody that has a menacing look and they want to molest your child. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to find out what hate means in a very short time. You're going to do it. Uh, we were out street preaching and this motorcycle jerk. I mean, he, he looked in at our list of sins there and he's acting like it was a scavenger hunt. Yeah, I got that one. I got that one. I got that one. Murder's the only one I didn't get. I felt like saying, well, that was the one that got me. It didn't. But uh, I just felt like saying that. Anyway, he tells one of the kids that's passing out. He says, hey, you come here. Now, I wouldn't have done it for myself, but I said, Brandon, you stay right there. I'd have punched that guy out if he would have tried to do anything to that kid. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way, and I hate people that destroy the word of God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, we realize as we sit and stand here today, one day,